Right then, hello. This is the first episode of The World According to Ali. That's me, by the way. Um, yeah, I was supposed to film this yesterday. This is Monday, the uh, 11th of January, and uh, I'm a bit naughty. I did say that I was going to film this last night, but um, didn't have access to a laptop and things were busy looking after Elliot and doing arts and crafts and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, it's Monday the 11th, um, I was competing on Saturday, um, first competition of the year, did the Ram Run obstacle race 12k, um, really good race, I performed horrifically. Um, for no particular reason, reason other than I lost my, my mental state. I went off course a few times and then went off course like a really like long detour and uh, I threw my toys out of the pram, you know, and that's really naughty and I need to slap myself on the wrist for that, you know. Um, as it turned out, I still qualified for the UK and the European Championships <laughs> off of what I did, which is really funny because I don't deserve it, but you know what? What are you going to do? Um, but I'm going to learn from that, be more professional, um, be more focused. And if stuff goes wrong, because it will go wrong, it didn't just go wrong for me, like a whole bunch of people went off course. So, you know, I just need to sort that out. Um, you know what? It was a really, just to sort of digress a little bit, I haven't done a write up yet either. People have been asking, and I'll be doing my write up. I just want to. Mentally, for me, that was probably the most I learnt about myself. Because um, obviously the lack of discipline in terms of like things going wrong, and I allowed that to throw me off course and then go, oh, I'm not going to race anymore, I'm just going to run. <sighs> Stupid. Yeah? Something goes wrong, knuckle down, go faster. Don't be an idiot like me. You know, that's wrong. I need to learn from that. I need to focus, stay on the job, get it done. Um, you know, looking for excuses to take your foot off the gas, that's pathetic. Right? So naughty, naughty on my part. Um, but also, the fear that I felt um, on Saturday. Um, some things like got, some doors got opened up in my mind and I was like, wow. And um, yeah, I'm, I think I'm such a control freak that one of my biggest fears in, in obstacle racing and indeed just physically and stuff in general is lowering myself without control. So if I'm shooting up a frame or a ladder or anything like that, back down the other side, not even a hesitation, not a thought. But like fireman poles, as hilarious as it is, will be wigging me out hard. So I'll go, and I really have been hesitating, but I've been getting better at fireman poles. But one of the obstacles on Saturday was a big bridge and a rope, and you had to lower yourself down the rope into a river that was about 10 foot deep and like going like that because of the rain. Man, I buckled mentally hard. I nearly quit the whole race because of how I felt. I was just petrified. Climbed over the side of the bridge, held onto that rope, and I just couldn't do it. You know, and I was watching people like trying to lower themselves down the rope, sliding down the rope and just falling in the river. And I was just terrified, absolutely terrified. And I pulled myself back up the rope and stood and hung on the side of that bridge. And I was just like thinking, you know, I'm just gonna quit. I can't do it. And then I was just like, man, look at, yeah, everyone else is doing it. Sort yourself out. You know, yeah, you're scared, but everyone else is doing it and there's safety all around and you've got to do it. How are you going to deal with yourself if you don't? How are other people going to deal with you? You know, and you may think to yourself, oh, do you know what? I can live with not doing this. It doesn't matter. But then when you've got to see other people and they're like, <laughs> they might not say it to your face, but they think less of you. And uh, so use that peer pressure to like, you know what? Get it done. And then I was strong enough to lower myself down the rope anyway and not slip. And then once I got in the water, yeah, it was cold and horrible, but you know what? It was all right, um, and yeah, but that that was interesting. So some some new mental ground was was like discovered, which is good, because then that means the stuff that like little weaknesses you discover, right? I'm gonna focus on that and nail it. But anyway, the main point of this video is supposed to be like a Q and A, and what I've done is on our Facebook group, on the PTS Facebook group, every Friday morning I'll post up and say, right, give me some questions. And then the three questions with the most likes by Sunday morning, I will answer anything, right? Doesn't matter what the questions are. Yeah, it can be about anything. Don't have to be about fitness, don't have to be about gym, it can be about anything. So the, uh, so the title of this video 
is uh, Horn, Voices and Queen because the top three questions were those subjects. So the first question, uh, I'm just looking at it now, is from Victoria White and she asked what is the mystical opposite of Horn? What a brilliant question. See you later dudes. Um, yeah, I'm multitasking. Anyway, uh, camera turned off for some reason. Um, what is the mystical opposite of horn? Um, and I believe that is a question first asked, or well, first I know of it, was in Bottom. I think it's from Bottom. Uh, Bottom live show, I think it was. And they were trying to make the Queen fall in love with them with a, a gas of some kind. And it caused them to, I don't know, things went wrong. But anyway, the mystical opposite of horn. Now, horn could be many things, a horn on your head, a, a trumpet or whatever, but I think in this instance we're looking at horn as a representation, physical representation of desire, yeah, physiological desire, being horny, right? So a lot of people immediately think the opposite of horn is something like to be crude, a limp dick, yeah? But that's just the absence of horn. The opposite of horn would be repulsion, wouldn't it? You know, like if the very thought of someone's skin touching yours would just, you know, like make you feel sick, you know, and no doubt there are some people that feel like that. And that is really sad, you know, that's just a, a sad state of being. But I think that's probably quite rare. And most people probably feel like that their, uh, you know, their lack of desire is the opposite of horn. Um you know, where they don't have any desire or desire is gone. And that's also sad, you know. Um, and, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you change that? Because desire is a great thing, you know. I mean, a really, really, really great thing. Desire will lead you down many paths, many doors. And it's something that people want to feel. Because if you don't have desire, then really, like, how do you get happy? You know, how do you even feel like you're getting anywhere with anything? You know, if you don't know what you want or you can't action what you want or feel desire. And, um, you know, lack of desire is usually come about through like, you, you're not practicing desire, you know. There must be something where, you know, you feel like, yes, this makes me excited. And that's what one of the things that desire does to you, it makes you excited. If you think about things that you desire, people that you desire, they have an effect on you. They make you go, oh, make you feel that heartbeat. You know, your adrenaline goes a little bit, your hands might shake. You know, that sort of thing. Real desire, right? Like, want that, want that. You know, people feel that about cars that they want. You know, people feel that about a, a, a job that they want. People feel that about, the, you know, the aspirations they have with their career. You know, people feel that about someone that they want to be with. You know, the, the desire of the situation drives people insane. And I say that's a good thing, you know, to feel that intensity of something, you know, it's a rush and that's a good thing. But it's hard to get straight into that. I think if you're in a, in a state where, you know, like you're, you suppress everything and you shut everything down because you're like, well, you know, you just sort of, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times I think desire is frowned upon because you think like, you know, the desire is bad, it will make you feel unhappy with where you are and so on and so forth. But it's like, you know what, if you, if you want something, then, you know, you should go for it. And, um, you know, the opposite or the absence of horn, you know, is something, you know, that can be dug out of, you know, absolutely. And I think what you need to do is think, what do you desire, right? And then really think about it. How does it make you feel? Yeah, it should make you feel like it's something you want. Something you want. Think about what you want. Yeah, and how it makes you feel. And then repeat that. Repetition, right? My business and how we implement change and affect change and create progress and development is all about repetition. Everything is repetition. Repetition to develop. Repetition to get better. Yeah? And this is no different. So if you're stuck in that land of like lack of desire, then think to yourself, you know what, there's something I want. How does that make you feel? Practice that. Repeat it. Let it go a little bit crazy. You know, think more. I want that. I want that. I want that. And then 
try and transfer that to other things that you might want and start kindling little fires in your in your in your mind about other areas of your life so you start filling like all that aspects of your life with a bit of desire you know and repeat it and keep repeating it all the time get better at it let yourself breathe a bit of fire when you think about certain subjects whether it be you know goals whether it be people you know let your heart beat strong you know for desire and uh, it might start motivating you to do things, yeah? You know, people are always going on about lack of motivation to do stuff. It's like, if you are absolutely filled to the brim, like pouring out your ears and eyes of desire, you'll be motivated to do stuff. But to get to that state, you need to practice, okay? And practice is repetition. And, you know, keep repeating it over and over and over and over. You know, just keep thinking about what you want, how it makes you feel. Nurture it, burn it, you know. And uh, yeah, it might make you crazy, it might make you obsessed. But I don't know anybody who went after what they want and got it without being obsessed. Basically, you know. Yeah, people get stuff all the time without being obsessed, but is that what they actually want or did they just stumble onto something? I'm talking about actually going after what you want. Obsession ain't no bad thing, you know. Um, so yeah, basically, yeah, the opposite of desire, uh, the opposite of horn is obviously repulsion, but probably more important is an absence of desire, and you just got to practice that and repeat it. Okay, so that's question one. So, uh, question two was from uh, Angela Owens, and she's but. I keep thinking I can't do stuff, lift, jump, etc. Any advice on how I can shut up the can't do this voices? Yeah, that's a really, 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 really good question. Yeah, I mean, what I was talking about, with what I experienced on Saturday, you know, with the, the fear holding onto the rope, that was the voices in my head. Yeah, they weren't a true reflection of what was going on, but they were a true reflection of how I was felt. Now, those voices, you know, people may, you know, sort of think, well, you know, how do you deal with this? How do you shut them up? Well, it's like trying to shut yourself up. You can't do that. That's you. Every time you go into any situation, any experience, you're going to process it and you're going to hear yourself, right? Um, you're going to hear these voices. You can't shut them up. They're you. Why would you want to shut them up? It's you. Do you value yourself so little that you want to shut yourself up? What you've got to understand, right, is that your life is like a maths equation, yeah? And it's basically the sum of everything you've experienced and how you've experienced it and what, you know, bias you've put it through up until this point right now. So your voices are just that equation. This is my terminology, obviously. And those voices just reflect that mathematical equation at this point now. And obviously the voices can change every single day because the equation will change and there's nothing wrong with that. As you develop and learn and experience new things, the voices will change because the equation has to change because you experience something new all the time. So the voices will change. But to silence them is like saying you want to wipe yourself out. You can't. Those voices are you, right? And when you try and silence them, what you're doing is you're basically making an enemy of yourself. Now, if you're making an enemy of yourself, and this is the... This question is really interesting about how do I shut up the voices, yeah? That's the wrong question. And that's why it's a brilliant question, yeah? Because it's not about how do I shut the voices up. It's about how do I make the voices be on my side. And you know what? You don't actually have to do anything for that. They are already on your side, okay? They're trying. Those voices are you. Those voices are trying to keep you safe or keep you, like, you know, protected. Because that's a lot of the time what the voices are doing. They're kind of like being, look, you know what? Do you really want to do this? It's like me going into that river, looking down at that torrent water. Do you really, really want to do this? Uh, no. No, I don't. But I did it anyway. The wisdom of that, well, you know, I'm still alive. In fact, you know what? It was fine. But... The voices themselves can't be silenced, okay? And trying to silence them is the problem, okay? 
that's the biggie, right? If you try and silence them, what you basically do is you get stuck in a loop, in a fight of conflict. You create conflict within yourself, okay? And that's not cool, because it's you, you know? If you can't trust yourself, who can you trust? So with the voices, whenever they say anything, you know, they're usually saying you can't do this or you shouldn't do this or, you know, sometimes the voices will say you should do this or you should do that. Listen to them. Take on board what they're saying. They're like your most trusted advisors. You know, a lot of people feel about like, you know, the voices in their head, you know, they say that they've got an angel and a devil and all that sort of stuff or they have demons. I really don't like that terminology because what that does is that makes aspects of yourself either seem evil or you know like flat out mythical right something that doesn't actually exist when do you know what these voices sitting on your shoulder they're you it's exactly you they haven't got horns they haven't got wings you know they haven't got a spiked tail they haven't got red blazing eyes there's none of that it's you so because it's you rather than thinking it's this some you know external thing that needs to be stopped yeah just listen to it listen to what he's saying it's your best advisor right there most of the time not always you know but if you've got a voice that's saying don't do this have a conversation with a voice you know why shouldn't i do this ah because of this right so you know what can we put a plan into place that takes care of these worries to the most that it can so that we can then proceed yeah or is there a particularly good reason why we can't proceed have a conversation with a voice that voice is your best friend you know and all these voices, the voices that encourage you, listen to them as well. Don't shut them off. The voices that go, yeah, do something crazy. You know, those voices might be saying this for a good reason. Yeah, listen to them, talk to them, do not silence them. Trying to shut them out creates conflict. That's not good. It's just not good. You know, any internal conflict, right? If you've got different directions going on in your mind, in your life, whatever, it... it just causes massive problems you can't move forward very well right if you can line up everything that you have inside you you can move forward that's what i think right and you know the the, the whole thing with the voices you know it's it's imperative that you don't fight with yourself right you listen to them you talk to them and you know like i said over time these voices will change because the equation that is your life will change naturally over time so you don't need to fight them. You don't need to silence them. You don't need to create conflict. You listen to them. Take on board what they're saying. And um, you may suddenly find yourself being able to approach things a lot easier. I should hope so anyway. Um, you know, so yeah. Interesting question. Which is, don't try and shut the voices up. You can't and you never will be able to. Yeah, listen to them. Hear what they're saying. They're looking after you because they're you. Yeah, so that's question two, hopefully answered. So final question was from Robert Flable. Oh, he's a cheeky monkey is our Robert. <laughs> um, so yeah, he asked, why do you insist on playing Queen in your gym? Truly overrated band. He then put light fuse, walk away. Yeah, very funny. But you know what, I like this question. I love this question, in fact, you know, because um, it's really easy to answer, yeah, um, but I'm not going to take the easy route, yeah, um, but it's my gym, right, um, and it's my music, so I'm going to play it because I like it, is, is the short answer, but then it's like, why do I like it, why do I like Queen, you know, first of all, are they overrated, no. You know, they've got legendary status and they should have. Freddie Mercury was, you know, the man was, it was insane, right? One of the most unique vocal talents of all time, you know, in my opinion. And the man pulled off a moustache, you know, like, that, that's, that's something magical right there. But you know what, Queen is something that I grew up with as a kid and their music still now has a big impact on me. Like, I hear it and I'm like, yeah! You know, and a lot of people feel like that, you know. It just makes you want to air guitar and it makes you want to rock out. And it just makes you want to, you know, unleash a bit, you know. And anything that makes that sort of, like, emotional resonance in you is a, is, is a cool thing, you know. And if you don't like Queen, then whatever, tough, 
deal with it. You're in my environment right now, you know. But um, another thing that I love about Queen is the Bohemian Rhapsody, right? Because for me, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody is like my top, uh, what's it, it's mental strength song, yeah? So when, whenever there's anything that I've got to do, that I've got to do, like, for example, over time, yeah, in, in a competition, right? Bohemian Rhapsody is what I will go through, yeah? You know, so you start singing, right? Now, the best example of this is probably the, um, the Kent's Hill Rumble fitness competition I did in November. And one of the events that we had to do is we had to hold a barbell overhead for 10 minutes, yeah, while our partner did shuttle sprints, right? Now, I'd already done the shuttle sprints. It's my turn to hold the barbell, and you had to hold it for like two five-minute segments, but one straight after the other. And our heat went up first, and so I'm standing there, and I thought, right, this is 10 minutes. It's only a seven kilo barbell, but still, you drop it once and you're out, right? So I'm like, okay, it's time to call on the magical powers of Freddy. And I started singing Bohemian Rhapsody, and because I was missing out a lot of the instrumental, I couldn't even air guitar, you know, you've got a barbell in your hands. So I managed to get through, in that 10 minutes, I managed to get through about two and a half lots of Bohemian Rhapsody before they blew the whistle and I collapsed on the floor. Um, but it was, it was, you know, it was painful, it was uncomfortable, but I was singing Bohemian Rhapsody out loud, right? And I think in my heat, because I was, was the first heat up, nobody else was singing, it was just me. And people were like, what's he doing? What's going on? There's loud music playing, right? So you can't really figure out what I'm doing. Um, and uh, I think Kerry was like filming me and like zoomed in on my face. And you can hear her say, what is he singing? And it was Bohemian Rhapsody. And it got me through. And our team won that event. Yeah, me, me and um, Dave Beaumont, we won that event, right? And then the next heat, you see everybody else singing. Everybody's just singing random songs. And I'm like, see, see, that's the effect that Queen has on people. That's the effect Freddie Mercury has on people. He inspired me to get through that event, win that event, you know, and then inspired other people to start singing. When people would have looked at me when I was singing, thinking, is he cracked? Is he nuts? What's that all about? So is Queen overrated? Hell no, you know, because they, they you know, Freddie's magic and his power, you know, transcends music, gets you through things, yeah, makes your heart beat. Again, going back to a little bit of that desire thing makes you excited. And uh, you know what? Special place in my heart for the man with a moustache. And uh, yeah, Freddie, you're a legend. Um, and I hope that answers that. Why do I insist on playing Queen in my gym? Because I like it, and for good reason. So, uh, right, that wraps up episode one of the...